Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Someone asked me recently that whenever we are seeking forgiveness, whenever I am repentant of my sins, why is it that I have to suffer for that? You know, why does that have to be a painful, uncomfortable experience whenever I want to, ex want to make up for my sins, right? Why can't, I, why can't I make up for my sins by going to Disney World? Or why can't I make up for my sins by doing something enjoyable or something of comfort, right? Why does it specifically have to be suffering and struggle and difficulty? And it's a rather philosophical question, but I think it's a fair one. Why, do, why does God ordain it that way? And we have to remember that forgiveness, specifically repentance, is very, very closely tied to love. As a matter of fact, they are inseparable. The degree to which I love is going to be the degree to which I am able to uh, seek and accept forgiveness. And so whenever I look at it in the context of love, seeking forgiveness for, uh, from the perspective of love, I can always look to God, who is love, as my model. And God, whenever he expresses his love for us, he always does it in a sacrificial manner, right? How did God express his love for us? He did it by giving us his very life. He sacrificed himself for us, something that we are all called to imitate. Now, I think one thing that's been kind of lost in the Advent season is a sacrificial, penitential spirit, right? Something that we are, are called to have during Advent, because what does St. John the Baptist call all of us to do. St. John the Baptist is the forerunner of the Christ, right? He, he proclaimed the coming of Christ. And what did he call us to do? He said, repent, repent, and believe in the gospel. And so the Advent season is very much about that. We prepare our hearts and minds for the coming of Christ in his incarnation through repentance, through sacrifice, through love, through preparation of our heart, minds, and souls to receive God. But the church also recognizes that we are a people of, a, of the good news, right? A people of a, a, a very joyful um, institution, a very joyful church that our Lord has set up, right? So even during her penitential, sacrificial seasons where we are called to make these sacrifices, we usually have at least one day, uh, in, the, in the case of, of Advent, it's today, Gaudete Sunday, where we remember the joy that we celebrate in our faith. And we remember specifically uh, that even when we sacrifice, even when we uh, enter into that spirit of penance, we do it with great joy. We do it with great love. So that's why during the Advent season you have Gaudete Sunday where you wear the rose-colored vestments to emphasize that we're still in that period of penance, we're still in that period of preparation, but we're uh, reserving this day specifically as a day of great joy, a day of, of great praise. Um, also during the season of Lent, you also see Laetare Sunday, which is the fourth Sunday of Lent where you have the same thing, where you take a step back from the penances, from the uh, sacrifices, and you remember the, the joy that is to come and the joy that you are, in fact, preparing yourself to celebrate, right? So today we approach uh, the Advent season from a little bit of a, a different perspective, maybe a little bit uh, more joyful, a little bit more, uh, rather a little less penitential um, in our uh, practices throughout the Advent season. I think the entire Advent season, and even today, can be summed up in St. Paul's letter to the Thessalonians that we had. Uh, he provides for us three commands. He, and he gives us three commands in his, sort of his opening lines that perfectly summarize the spirit of Advent. He's writing to the Thessalonians, which by the way, is the earliest Christian text that we have, the earliest Christian text that we know of. Now, there could be, I suppose, 
other Pauline letters or something like that that uh, that we just ha have been undiscovered, we never found, or we don't know about. But this is the earliest one in the scriptures that we have. It's written around the year 50. And uh, this is towards the very end of the St. Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. And what does he say? He tells them, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in all circumstances, give thanks. Those three different commands. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in all circumstances, give thanks. Three commands that seem rather impossible, right? Three things that it seems like you wouldn't be able to fulfill those commands taken literally, uh, even if you tried, even if you wanted to. And Paul was sort of known for speaking in these types of extremes, these, this, this radical presentation of his uh, preaching to the, those who were accepting his word, right? And so when we hear this, it can be, so we can, we can kind of take a step back and say, well, what exactly is Paul talking about? Number one, how, do, how does one rejoice always? How is one in a constant state of rejoicing? You know, someone was making reference just the other day about all of the wildfires going on in California right now and things like that. I doubt that they're rejoicing right now, right? You know, there's this a time of great suffering, a time of great struggle. Uh, how are they supposed to be in a spirit of rejoicing? Or this command from Paul to pray without ceasing. You can take Trappist monks or Carthusian monks, like the, the, the Marine Corps of, of prayers in the church, right? You know, and even they take breaks from their prayer. You know, they've got to uh, do their work. They've got to eat their meals. They've, you know, they, they even take times of rest in the afternoon. Uh, even they take those breaks. So what does Paul mean when he tells, tells us that we have to pray without ceasing? And then he says, in all circumstances, in all circumstances give thanks give thanks notice paul in all of his instructions he leaves no room for anything else he doesn't say to us you know when it's appropriate make sure you rejoice and when you have time in your day make sure you work in some prayer and always be thankful for the gifts that you're, you've you've been given or whatever no, he, he doesn't leave it vague at all he's very very deliberate very direct in what he says Always, without ceasing, and in all circumstances, you are to do these things. And we might find that as something that seems radical, right? Seems extreme. But in fact, when we apply it to the Christian life and we apply it to our faith, it's not. It's not at all. It's the exact disposition we're all called to have and the disposition specifically we need to have during this Advent season. Because the true Christian, one who is stable in the message of Christ and has accepted the radical, life-changing message of Jesus, then one cannot help but to rejoice always. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that one never experiences sadness or that in some ways we're supposed to be on this emotional high all of the time, right? That's not what Paul is talking about. What Paul is talking about is that Christ has come. His presence has been made known to us. Now we have something to hold on to. We have the opportunity to make it to heaven. We have the opportunity to live in the grace of God, to grow closer to God in a way that we never could have done before. We can now receive our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. We can receive him in Holy Communion. This is a big deal. This is reason to rejoice. So there's always this underlying joy. There's always this underlying stability, this underlying peace that God is calling us to have even in the midst of struggle, even in the midst of difficulty. This is why our Lord called the disciples so often, be not afraid. He wasn't talking about the emotion of fear. He was talking about living in that stability, living in that peace of Almighty God, that in the end, if I surrender to the will of God, I know that He, God, Christ, will make all things right if I can surrender to his will. This is the joy that Paul is talking about. 
Now, he also instructs us to pray without ceasing. This is actually a very important instruction. There's a, a book, uh, some, some of you might have heard me reference it before, The Way of the Pilgrim, where there's this uh, anonymous pilgrim who's going around and he's, uh, he heard a sermon actually uh, from this very passage of scripture, from St. Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, where he heard St. Paul say, pray without ceasing, and he wondered what that meant. So he goes on this journey looking for an answer to this question. He heard great sermons on the necessity of prayer and that you can't get to heaven without prayer and prayer is something that you, you, you must do to be close to God. But he'd never heard any sermons on how to pray and what, what it, how you actually go about doing that. And so one day he found a spiritual director, someone, uh, an elder, who could guide him in this path and teach him how to do it. And what, what the spiritual director taught him to do is he taught him to pray the Jesus prayer. And he said, I want you to pray, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And I want you to say that over and over again until it becomes uh, something natural to you, right? So he says, I want you to pray that prayer 3,000 times a day. And he says, okay. So he gives him this little prayer rope that he holds in his hands and he builds a hut for himself and he goes to work, right? He starts uh, making baskets and doing all different kinds of work and stuff. And while he's doing that, he's praying his Jesus prayer, trying to keep track of how many times he's saying it, you know. Uh, he goes over his 100 bead rope and makes sure he gets his 3,000 Jesus prayers in every day. And does that for a week and he goes back to his spiritual director and he says, okay, I did it. And his spiritual director says, okay, that's great. Now I want you to do it 6,000 times a day. And so he says, okay. So he goes and he starts working hard at it and he gets his 6,000 Jesus prayers in every day. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And he does that for a week and he goes back to his spiritual director and he says, okay, great. It's good that you were able to do that. Now I want you to say it 12,000 times a day. And he, he looks at him, he says, 12,000 times a day? I don't, I don't think I'll have enough time in the day to say it that many times. He says, well, just try it. So he goes off and he, he starts it. He starts praying the, the Jesus prayer. And he's trying to keep track of how often he's saying it, trying to say it 12,000 times a day. And he realizes that he's just saying it unceasingly. He's, he's, there's never a time when he's not saying it. He even wakes up one night in his sleep and he realizes that as he's breathing, as he's sleeping, he's praying the Jesus prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. It's, it's a part of his very life breath, even as he sleeps. And he came to realize it's not about the number, right? It's not about how many times you say this prayer. It's about the practice of maintaining the name of our Lord before your heart and mind at all times. Always living in the presence of Almighty God being always able to keep that perspective of, number one, my thoughts oriented towards our Lord, but just being under that mantle, being under that protection of the name of Jesus. This is what it means to pray without ceasing, to practice that presence of God in everything that I do, in every action that I take, every work that I undertake, every suffering that I endure, I can do that with the practice of the presence of God. Now, again, this spiritual director taught his pilgrim through the Jesus prayer. You can do that through many different ways. Uh, how, how I go about maintaining that presence of God is how God inspires me to do that. It could be through the rosary or uh, through some type of daily meditation that I like to use, but always maintaining that God-centered focus that nothing can take me away from that focus of God. Have we ever thought about that, particularly with regard to our thoughts? You know, would God want me thinking about this right now? Is this pleasing to God? Or what we watch, is what I'm watching right now pleasing to God? Is this going to help get me to heaven? And again, this is why this is, this is the disposition we're called to have in Advent, right? We're preparing to meet Christ, just like we're preparing to meet our Lord at our final judgment. Should I be looking at this? Should I be listening to this? Does this 
help me to stay closer to God? Does this help me to pray without ceasing? Or does this take me away from that? Cardinal Sarah recently released a book called The Power of Silence Against the Dictatorship of Noise, a, a profound book. If you have the opportunity to read it, I highly recommend it. The Power of Silence Against the Dictatorship of Noise. And one of his main points in that book is that you can't hope to have interior silence, that interior reflective heart where you reflect on God. You cannot hope to have that without some semblance of exterior silence, right? If there is not in some way I'm trying to get rid of some of the noise, some of the distractions, some of the things around me that distract me from that presence of God, I can't hope to maintain an interior reflective heart. I cannot have that disposition that St. Paul calls me to have. Pray without ceasing. What are some of the ways that I need to do this in the Advent season? How can I prepare myself, prepare my heart to meet Christ in a new way? Is this Christmas going to be just like every other Christmas, right? Where it's going to be filled with anxiety and stress and family and in-laws and people that I probably don't really want to talk to and all of these things coming together at once and it you know, very easily shifts from things about God to all of these stresses, or is my Christmas going to be about growing closer and having a new encounter with my infant Savior because I took advantage of the Advent season, because I took that opportunity to prepare my heart and my soul to be ready for his coming in Christmas. Very powerful, very important time the church has given to us to be able to do that. And lastly, Paul says, in all circumstances, give thanks. In all circumstances, give thanks. Well, what about those who, you know, get diagnosed with cancer or someone who dies in a tragic car accident or uh, someone who uh, suffers some incredible tragedy? Are we supposed to give thanks then? According to St. Paul and the church, that we say, absolutely, absolutely, we give thanks in the midst of suffering. We give thanks in the midst of struggle. Why? Why would we do that? It's a part of the paradox of the spiritual life, that everything that God did, everything that God touched, everything that God influenced, specifically human nature, when he became man, he sanctified it, he dignified it, he made it something worthy, and not the least of which was God suffered. He died on the cross. So I know that whenever I suffer, whenever I endure a struggle, I do the same work, the same action, the same salvific economy, I participate in that, that God did and does continually. And so it gives meaning to that. It gives purpose and direction. It, it helps me to see why this happened, because God's going to bring about something greater from it. He's going to make it something meaningful, and I can give thanks for that. I can give thanks for the fact that God has allowed me to participate in his divine providence. That's actually a very big deal. That's a very important thing to participate in the divine providence of Almighty God. And we have no greater opportunity to do that than when we suffer, than when we struggle. Because that's how God brought about the salvation of all mankind. So today, on this Gaudete Sunday, what we're preparing for is more than just another Christmas right? We're preparing to meet our incarnate Savior, to have a deeper relationship with him, to grow our spiritual life, to bring ourselves into deeper connection with God. 
What do I need to root out of my life? What do I need to let go of? In what ways do I need to make sure I'm giving thanks in all circumstances, even in my struggles? Am I making sure that I'm rejoicing in all circumstances? And am I really making that effort to pray without ceasing? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.